it's about to get crazy in here. First day dealing with the proof. Hope you're excited. Now I know today's proof might get a little overwhelming, but we're gonna step it back tomorrow and we'll get into algebraic proofs, which would make a lot more sense, be a lot easier to you. Um, and then we'll start building from that. So today, it might get a little intense, might seem kind of confusing, but we'll talk through it. And then tomorrow, it'll be a lot better, I promise. So first things first, before we can start writing proofs, we gotta talk about postulates and theorems. So a postulate, first of all, is a statement that is accepted as true without proof. So we do not need to prove these. We just accept them as, as true. And we talked about all these postulates that I got here. Through any two points, there's exactly one line. Through any three non-collinear points, there's exactly one plane. These are all definitions we've already done so far this year. Right, two, three, a line contains at least two points. Two, four, a plane contains at least three non-collinear points. Um, if you look, these two are kind of vice versa, right? 2, 1 and 2, 3 are kind of vice versa. 2, 2 and 2, 4 are kind of vice versa. Uh, and 2, 5, if two points lie in a plane, then the entire line containing those points are on that plane. Um, if you really think about that one, that should make sense. And we got two more. If two lines intersect, their intersection is exactly one point. Okay, we've talked about that before. 2, 7, if two planes intersect, then their intersection is a line. Okay, we've talked about all the things. We've defined these things. They're postulates. They're just known facts. We do not need to prove them. Well, a theorem okay, is a statement or conjecture that has been proven. A so it started as a theory, and then once it was proved, it's then be called a theorem. So we can use these as reason to justify statements and proofs, and we'll see that um, here eventually. So in our proofs, we're always going to be given something, and then we're going to give a statement with a reason behind it to tell us how to prove something, to, to stand behind um, how we can prove um, from what's given. Okay, and there's things called paragraph proofs. We're not gonna really use any paragraph proofs. Um, it's basically just writing a proof in sentence form, in a paragraph, okay? Uh, I'd rather see it in a two column proof, which we're gonna talk about here. We're going to be using two column proofs instead. Put some asterisks, show how important that is. Uh, two column proofs are going to be much better. It's a lot easier to see what you're doing, where the reasoning goes with the statement, all kinds of things. So we're not going to do a paragraph proof. It's basically just writing our, our proofs in sentences. And we're not going to worry about that. Okay, so we're going to deal with two column proofs instead. And I'll show you how we set those up in a bit here. So first things first, uh, you're going to be given statements and we're going to decide whether it's always, sometimes, or never true. And this will kind of help us build into uh, using reasoning in our proofs. So number one, it says, if plane T contains, should say contains, I forgot my ass there, EF and EF. So let's look at number one. If plane T contains, it should say contains, forgot my S, contains EF, and EF contains point G, then plane T contains point G. Uh, it might get kind of confusing. Sometimes it helps to draw a picture just to see what the heck is going on here. So there's a plane that we call this plane T. And I'm saying it's got a line called EF on there. So let's draw that E, F, I got a line, boosh. There we go, label those EF. And now it says an EF contains point G. So somewhere on this line, Point G is there. So then plane T contains point G. Well, does plane T contain point G if it's on EF and EF is on that plane? Yeah, that always is the case. That always is the case. If that line is on that plane and a point is on that line, then the point is also, right? It's kind of like our transitive property, right? Uh, and two, GH contains three non-collinear points. Well, if I have a line called GH here, would it contain three non-collinear points? Would it contain points not on that line? That doesn't make any sense. If I have a line, all the points are on the line, aren't they? So there's no way that can happen. I can't have a line and, and points on that line not be on it. So that's never. All points on that line would be collinear because they're on the line, right? So that doesn't make any sense. So I was just saying, 
uh, either always, sometimes, or never given the case. Our first theorem we're given here is the midpoint theorem, and this should make sense. If M is the midpoint of AB, then AM is congruent to MB. So basically it's saying, I have a segment AB, and if M is the midpoint, which is smack dab in the middle, M, then AM is congruent to MB. Right? That should make sense. If it's right in the middle, those two should be congruent. They should be the same. Remember, this means congruent right here. Okay, That symbol means congruent. Well, let's use that. We're going to use that in a proof now. It says point L is the midpoint of JK. JK intersects MK at K. If MK is congruent to JL, prove that LK is congruent to MK. Whoa, mind blown for sure. Let's draw a picture and let's think this through. Drawing a picture is always going to help if there isn't one. So point L is the midpoint of JK. I better draw my segment JK here. JK. And it says L is the midpoint. So somewhere in there, that's L. I know that these are congruent, so I'm going to mark those. Well, JK intersects MK at K. If it intersects it, they make a point, right? So I'll do this. Put MK right there. Well, MK is congruent to JL. Let me use a different color here. So MK is congruent to JL. Oh boy. Should be noticing some here. So if I know, and lastly, I want to prove that LK is congruent to KF. So I want to prove that LK, which is right here, is congruent to MK, which is right here. I want to prove those two congruent. So let's start right away with our two column proof. So what we do for a two column proof, we have statements and we have reasons behind our statements. Number one, well first thing, what did it tell us? It said that L is the midpoint of JK. So I gotta write that, L is the midpoint. I like to abbreviate a lot of stuff, of uh, JK. L is the midpoint of JK. What else did it tell me? It told me that JK intersects MK at K. So I always write the things that it gave me right away. Intersects MK at K. Well, I gotta have a reason behind that. Well, the only reason is it gave it to you. So we call it the given, right? It gave it to you. So we they say that is given. That is given. Well, eventually we want to get to these two guys being congruent, LK and MK. So I gotta bring in some congruence here. Well, if I think about this, it's telling me that MK is congruent to JL. Well, isn't that given as well? So let's add that into our given. MK is congruent to JL. Always write down everything you're given into that first reason for given. So now let's see where we can go. That, this is going to be my last part. My last part is going to say LK is congruent to MK. So how can I get there? What else do we know? Well, let's use some of this stuff. If L is the midpoint of JK, L is the midpoint of JK. Let's look at my picture here. Well, what do I know? I know that JL and LK are congruent because of that, right? So I can state that. I can state that JL is congruent to LK. And why are they congruent? Well, they're congruent because L is the midpoint, right? So what's my reasoning behind that? Well, isn't that the definition of a midpoint? Definition of a midpoint. Definition of a midpoint, right? If a point is the midpoint, then the other two segments it makes are congruent. I can state that. So this is how it kind of works for every proof. You write down the givens. So number one, I wrote down all the givens. You'll probably use some of the given to make another statement. So for example, I use that L is the midpoint to write down this statement, right? That uh, I use the definition of a midpoint to get that. And after I do everything, now I gotta figure out, well, where am I going to? I'm going to LK is being congruent to MK. Well, if I look at my, my, two, my two last statements here, MK is congruent to JL, and JL is congruent to LK. 
Well, what do I notice? They both have a JL in it, don't they? They both have a JL. So for three, there's two things I can do. Well, if MK is congruent to JL, and LK is also congruent to JL, would that make MK congruent to LK as well? You bet it does. And there are two ways I can state this. Well, if one is congruent to the other, and that one is congruent to something else, then MK and LK have to be congruent, right? So I could say that that is the transitive property, right? We used that in the law of syllogism the other day. Transitive property. The other thing I could have said is, I really just substituted MK in for JL, right? Because I said MK is congruent to JL. Well, I could just plug in MK for JL then, couldn't I? So that's really just substitution. So I could have said substitution as well. Substitution. A lot of different things I can say here. And I'm done, because I just proved what I just asked me, right? That LK is going to go to MK. Technically, I should have it in the exact order that it showed me in the first place. And we'll get into this property. We haven't learned this property yet. We're going to get into my algebraic one tomorrow. But So really, I should write LK is congruent to MK, because technically, I'm using the symmetric property to do that. I won't worry so much about that today, uh, but in the future, we're going to be very specific on how we state our proofs. Okay, So it gets kind of confusing here. I know this is kind of difficult. Um, and the more we do these, the more you're going to understand. So it's okay if you're confused. We'll talk through it in class. Uh, on, you only have one problem on a proof. Uh, so do the best you can, and I'll, I'll come around and help you out. So 16 through 30, there you go.